ان الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله Indeed, all praise is due to Allah, and as such, we should praise Him, seek His help, and seek refuge in Allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds. For whomsoever Allah has guided, none can misguide, and whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray, none can guide. And I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad wasallam, is the last messenger of Allah. Indeed, the most truthful form of speech is the Book of Allah and the best source of guidance, the guidance brought by Muhammad And the worst of all affairs are the innovations in religion for every innovation in religion is cursed and all cursed innovations lead to misguidance and all misguidance leads to the hellfire. The soul of Ramadan addresses the idea that as a human being has a body and a soul, the body represents the outer part, the outside of the person, and the real person is the inside, is that one on the inside, the one looking out through the eyes, thinking through the brain, listening through the ears, touching with the hands, walking with the feet. That soul that is within that body is the reality of the person. You can lose an arm, you can lose an eye or a leg. That doesn't change you. You might be affected by it, you might respond to it in different ways depending on how it happens, but the leg, the arm, the eye, the brain, the foot is not really you. You are the soul, the most important aspect of this being. Well, the being is a combination of body and soul, but the soul is the core, is the heart of the individual. Similarly, when we speak about the soul of Ramadan, we're talking about the inner goals of Ramadan. The outer part we all know. The rules that govern it are well known. But it is the inner part which allows us to achieve the goals which were set by Allah for those who fast. When Allah said, Ya ayu al-ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala al-ladheena min qablikum, la'allakum tattaqoon. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you, in order that you develop a consciousness of Allah. Taqwa. La'allakum tattaqoon. That perhaps you may be among those who fear Allah, fear His displeasure, who are conscious of Him in their day-to-day -day lives. So Allah here identifies the primary goal as this state of consciousness. It is the essence of Ihsan. When we hear of Islam, Iman, and then the last level, Ihsan, when Ihsan is described, we all know what Islam is and what Iman is, what are the five pillars of Islam, the six pillars of Iman, of faith. Ihsan, or true goodness, that Ihsan is achieved through worshipping Allah as if we see Him and worshipping Him, knowing that He sees us. 
this is the ultimate goal of the fast. This is, and this represents the soul of the fast. And this is why Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was narrated by Abu Huraira to have said, لَيْسَ الصِّيَامُ مِنَ الْأَكْلِ وَالشُّرْبِ فقط. Fasting is not just abandoning or giving up eating and drinking. إِنَّمَا الصِّيَامُ مِنَ الْلَغْوِ وَالرَّفَثِ Indeed, fasting is also, and more importantly, from lagu. Lagu is uh, meaningless, pointless, useless talk, useless thoughts, words, actions. Warrafath corrupt thought, words, and actions, corruption in all of its various forms. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ went on to say, فَإِن سَابَكَ أَحَدٌ If anyone curse you, starts arguing with you, speaking ill of you, وَجَاهِلَ عَلَيْكَ and they use the most ignorant terms, calling you an idiot, a fool, a buffoon, whatever. Fakul say to them, Inni sa'im. I'm fasting. I will not participate in what you are calling to. That is a sense of control a sense of control which distinguishes one who is conscious of Allah from one who is not. It's not to say that people who are not conscious of Allah may not restrain their tongues, avoid saying things or doing things that they shouldn't do, but they do it for a variety of reasons, ulterior motives that when these uh, motives that, that are driving them are no longer attainable, then you will see their reality. Whereas the one who does this out of fear of the displeasure of God, of Allah, then there are no times when it's going to be pleasing to Allah. So they are going to be consistent. So it is this consistent state that we seek. And because of that, the act of fasting is looked at in general as being a secret between the worshiper and his or her Lord. And that is why the, the reward for it is unique. A special gate in paradise set aside for those who fast. Those who fast sincerely. Those who have grasped the soul of Ramadan. Who have understood its reality and have fasted in accordance with it. Fasting the way the Prophet وسلم, used to fast. Not the celebration, the Ramadan nights, the foods, the games, the whatever that people customarily do around the world in Muslim countries and communities, etc. associated with fasting but really which have very little to do with fasting at all. So when we consider the fast as being one in which we are conscious of Allah, then it means that the fast is fundamentally a soul fast. It is a fasting of the soul. 
And in the fasting of the soul, the believer fasts from the satanic whisperings. The whispering which comes in his or her heart from himself or from herself or from those around when the satanic whisper, whisperings reach our ears we cannot close our ears but we don't allow them a place to settle and to grow in our hearts so we block them from our hearts so of course in order to help ourselves do that we avoid circumstances where people are talking trash we avoid circumstances where people are viewing corruption and as such our eyes fast our tongues fast our hands and our feet all of our body parts engage in this fast they participate in the fast so it is a whole body fast guided by the soul that is the inner element of the fast that we should be constantly aware of and that is why <clears throat> Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari to have said, Man lam yada' qawl al-zur wal-amal bi wal-jahal falaysa lillahi haja an yada' ta'amahu wa sharaba. That whoever doesn't give up speaking lies, false words, stories, etc., and acting in accordance with such corruption and ignorant behavior then Allah has no need for him to or no reward for him to give up or her to give up their food and their drink because that isn't the goal it is only a means. You see, we sometimes get caught up with the means. The distinction between the means and the goal. The body does these actions externally. But the goal is an internal goal. It's a goal of the soul. The soul's goal. That's what we strive to achieve when we talk about soul of Ramadan so it is completely internalized we have to internalize all of these ideas these concepts these principles in terms of how we carry ourselves it's our behavior it's our character our real character and of course to build that character it requires restraint self-restraint so among the goals when we talk about the the goals of the soul of Ramadan we should note that prohibition of food and drink is not in order to burden us Allah didn't do so to burden us it's not it's not to torture us it's not to punish us this is not the purpose the purpose behind it is really <clears throat> that one a worshiper when a worshiper abandons what is beloved what is desired for Allah's sake because Allah has prohibited it even though it is halal when one does that what one trains oneself in is giving priority to the love of Allah over the love of what we love. Giving priority to the love of Allah over the love of the things that we love in this world. 
which can become a curse for us. Why Allah sometimes tells us in the Quran, beware, believers, that your wives and your children, for women, your men and your, your, your children, are your enemies. Enemies in what sense? Enemies in the sense that when we become addicted to them, they become a curse for us. We give them priority over what is right and wrong. We become blinded because of our love of the things of this world. So in the fast, one trains oneself to love what is pleasing to Allah over what is pleasing to ourselves. And this is ultimate is the ultimate in worship of Allah. Because we should love what Allah loves and hate what Allah hates if we are to truly worship Him. We can't be loving what He hates and hating what He loves. This doesn't work. We're off track. We're in the wrong direction. So, by us giving precedence to what is pleasing to Allah, of what is pleasing to ourselves, we are in fact humbling ourselves before Allah. And the more we humble ourselves, the closer we become to Allah. The greater our Iman becomes. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ had said that when a slave worships Allah by prostrating, he or she becomes closest to Allah at that state, at that point. This is when our link to Allah is the strongest, when we have lowered ourselves as much as we possibly can. And also when we give gratitude, when we express our gratitude to Allah, the best way, what the Prophet Muhammad used to do was, sujood shukr Whenever something really good happened, the prostration of gratitude was his way of expression, expressing immediately his thanks to Allah. He would fall down in prostration, whether he was in wudu, out of wudu, direction, not sure, qibla, whatever, it's not, it's not important. Just drop down. Lower yourself. And that brings us closer to Allah, closer to the reality of servitude, or what is known as ubudiyah. To be an abd, to be a true slave of Allah. So, this is amongst the, the elements of the inner goal, the taqwa. Because how can one be uh, giving priority, how can one give priority to what is pleasing to Allah over what is pleasing to oneself if he or she is not conscious of Allah. So this act of giving priority increases our consciousness. The more we are conscious, the more we will increase in giving that priority to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Furthermore, when one fasts, one becomes accustomed or develops more of a, a, a habit of being patient in doing what is pleasing to Allah, becoming patient in obedience to Allah, and also patient in avoidance of sin and disobedience to Allah. So this is another facet of Taqwa. And the fasting helps to develop this characteristic where we are patient in doing what Allah has commanded. Normally we think of patience in doing what? Patience in not doing what is displeasing to Allah when He commanded us, right? Or He took something away from us. He punished us to be patient with it. We hold ourselves back from reacting. But there's also the higher level of patience, which is 
to continue to do it means it's really consistency, to be consistently doing what is pleasing to Allah. You have to have a level of patience, which is another type of patience, which can keep you on doing what you're supposed to do. Praying on time in the Fajr, you know. Sometimes you're on, sometimes you're off. But to stay on continually, that requires a level of patience which, which fasting develops when one fasts according to the way of Rasulullah sallallahu Meaning that fasting, as we said, is the fasting of the eyes, the hands, all of the body parts. So if we work on this element, you know, of of not looking, saying, doing the things that are displeasing to Allah, then we strengthen our will, our ability to be patient to do what is in fact pleasing to Allah, which is that we don't look at those things that are displeasing to Him, we don't say those things which are displeasing to Him, we don't touch or go to, walk to those places or things that are in fact displeasing to him. So, Ramadan is commonly called the month of patience. Shahru Sabr, the month of patience, because we are controlling ourselves. Also in the Quran, where Allah said, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ وَإِنَّهَا لَكَبِيرَةٌ إِلَّا عَلَى الْخَاشِعِينَ Seek help. Seek help in, in worshipping Allah, in, in being close to Allah, in being a true servant of Allah through sabr, patience, and salah, and prayer. Because it is in fact something really great, a great thing, really difficult thing to do except for those who truly fear Allah. Now, Mujahid, one of the students of Ibn Abbas, who was known as the interpreter of the Quran, he said that sabr here meant fasting. So Allah is saying, seek uh, help in fasting and prayer. And there are other verses in the Quran which talk about fasting and prayer. But even but here, fasting is called patience. And that's one of the reasons also why they call it the month of patience. Fasting also, in terms of its core values, develops a consciousness of our need for Allah, human need for Allah that we are in fact under his command because we eat when he tells us to eat and we don't eat when he tells us not to eat and that food that we love the, the drinks that we like to drink all of this where does it come from? it comes from Allah without him providing it we could not enjoy it so when we control ourselves, we reflect on the food and the drink and the other pleasures which Allah has given us, which we restrain from, eating when the sun sets, not eating from the break of dawn, then what we're doing here is realizing that state of servitude where we are in need of Allah. As Allah said, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ أَنْتُمُ الْفُقَرَاءِ إِلَى اللَّهِ Oh, people, you are poor and in need of Allah. وَاللَّهُ هُوَ الْغَنِيُّ الْحَمِيدِ While Allah, on the other hand, is غني. He is free of any need. And الْحَمِيدِ And He is the praiseworthy. Naturally, by Him having no need, free of all needs and everyone needs him, then realization of that need is praising him. And he deserves that praise. 
He doesn't need the praise, but he deserves it. So, in the in the fast, understanding this element of the fast also is very very important because it's an element needed in our lives that we recognize our need for Allah, and this is also a part of taqwa, a part of that consciousness of Allah. Because if we don't realize our need for Allah, we tend to think that we can fulfill our needs in this world. That whatever we need can be achieved by the things around us. But in fact, they can't be. Because only unless Allah allows them to fulfill our need, a need which we might have, we are thirsty, we drink, and the thirst goes away with the drink. What gave the drink the ability to remove the thirst. It is Allah. Otherwise we could drink and it doesn't remove any thirst. It is by Allah's will, by His wish, that drinking removes thirst. So we need Allah. And the fast should remind us of it. And as a closing point, we should realize in this need, the need to fast, which Allah has prescribed for us, it is also a means of reducing our own appetites, our own desires. Which is why the Prophet Muhammad had said, Ya ma'ashar al-shabaab, man istata'a minkum al-ba'a falyatazawaj, O young people, whoever amongst you is able, should marry. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ And whoever is not able, فَعَلَيْهِ بِالصَّوْمِ Then, he should fast. فَإِنَّهُ لَهُ وِجَاء Because it is a shield, it is a protector for himself or herself. So, the fast, when done properly, again, if it is the fast of custom, in the Muslim world today, then it will not have this impact. Because we're eating till we can't eat anymore at Fajr, stuffing ourselves, and we're digesting the food during the day. We finish digestion in the evening, time to eat again at sunset. Now, that kind of fast is not going to reduce our desires. It only increases our desires. And that's why most of us end up gaining weight in Ramadan. So, if we are to reduce the desires, and by reducing our desires for the material things, the pleasurable things of this world, then it, is, it gives us our minds, our, 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 our soul, a chance to think and to reflect. Allah. We are not obscured by the various desires. So, fasting, as I said in the beginning, has a soul. As it has a body, don't eat, drink, have sexual relations during the daylight hours. You can eat in the night. For some people, they turn the night into the day and the day into the night. What kind of fast is that? This is not one in which we have realized the soul of Ramadan. One in which we realize the soul of Ramadan is one in which our taqwa is increased. Our consciousness of Allah is heightened. And as a result of that is that we will have more good deeds. We will be trying to do more, whether it's reading Qur'an, because Allah associated the month with Qur'an. He said, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنَ هُدَنْ لِلنَّاسِ The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed as guidance to humankind. This is part of the consciousness. So we read the Qur'an 
to increase that consciousness, to heighten that awareness, the faith. Not reading the Quran to make a note that we read the whole Quran in Ramadan, we just got through it. Or listening in Taraweeh because we like the voice of this reciter or that reciter or the other reciter. So it's like, you know, a pop show. No. It is listening to the Quran and reflecting. You know the section of the Quran that the Imam is going to read. Then get the English translation or German or whatever language you speak and read it. Know what this, this section of the Quran is about. So when the Quran is being recited, you can reflect on what Allah is speaking about. Because taqwa with regards to the Quran is reflection on its meanings. As Allah said, Quran. Will they not reflect on the Quran, on the meanings of the Quran? Am ala aqfaluha, or are their hearts locked up? So it's only the external, the external act of reading the Quran, placing the Quran on a high place, protecting the Quran, the physical Quran. But the actual message of the Quran lost. So I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the soul of Ramadan, this Ramadan, to make it the best Ramadan that we have ever participated in that it will be a life-changing experience where we focus, especially in the last 10 days, we try to give our utmost to try to taste Iman in this month. Because once we have tasted Iman, then we can never go astray. Inshallah. This is all that we need to do. We all need to taste Iman. We need to realize faith. And that's what the soul of Ramadan is about. Taqwa. Ihsan. Righteousness at the highest possible levels. So, with that, I'm going to turn over the floor to those who are attending webinar to share uh, whatever questions they have um, we're taking them through emails uh, chat etc and we'll try to answer as many as we can in the next 15 20 minutes inshallah but I hope what is most important and I'm sure many of you are going to start questioning about the picky details um, what if we picked our teeth after we finished eating, you know, and we started the fast? Does that food break our fast? If we spit it out, it won't. If we eat it, it will. What's the situation? You know, we have all these types of questions that we have to ask. Uh, I'm sure that's probably where we're going to end up. But I do hope that what I've said maybe caused some of us to reflect and to think about what Ramadan is really all about. What really is the heart and soul of Ramadan? Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Bilal, for the very enlightening session. Uh, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with the tawfiq so that we can make the most of this Ramadan and make it one of the best Ramadan we've ever had. So with that, dear sisters and brothers, we're now opening the floor for the question and answer session. Please email your questions on Ramadan to ask.iou at islamiconlineuniversity.com. We'll start the session now, inshallah. Sheikh will take the questions one by one, inshallah. Okay, first question. Fatima Al-Aqad from Saudi Arabia, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, question. Does the congregation prayer have the same reward for women as it has for men. They are meeting all the conditions of the Sharia. 
yes, it would have the same reward. But a woman who prays in her home, she will also get that congregational reward. She will not lose anything if she prays in her home diligently, or sets aside a place to pray, prays on time, or prays with the family, brings the children together, whatever, you know, the family. If her husband's there, sends him to the masjid. But prays in the home, she will get that reward also. Uh, second question from Marina Qasim, Saudi Arabia. If a menstruating woman is required to feed the needy during Ramadan, no, she's not. No, she's not. She uh, <clears throat> makes up those days after Ramadan is over. Question from Abu Saad, from Qatar. Is there a financial limit that a person has to have, I guess, to receive zakah? In other words, how do we define the fuqara and masakin, as mentioned in the ninth chapter, verse 60? Yes, there's a minimum exemption limit. I mean, well, if you are below that level, you are, you, those on whom zakah is not obligatory are those who can receive zakah. But of course, if you are choosing uh, who to give zakah to, you give it, you know, maybe according to those who are closest to you. You do have an obligation to those who are closest to you, you know, those who are in your vicinity, those who you have responsibility uh, for in one way or another. So they get priority, but um, at the same time, uh, the financial limit, the person, when a person has uh, beyond the, the level of gold, you know, around 2.5 ounces of gold, whatever it is that is set, and, and that may translate into different amounts when uh, looked at according to currencies in different countries, etc. But anybody who is below that basic amount, uh, who has had it for a year, means it's surplus wealth. We're talking about not just simply having that amount, but having it as surplus wealth. Then that person is eligible. But of course, you choose those who are the most needy. You know, uh, masakin and and uh, the fuqara, fuqara, the general poor masakin are those who you don't necessarily know are poor. You know, because they're quiet about it. They're not visibly poor. But you go looking for them, you find that, in fact, they are really poor. But, um, yes, there is a lower level, just as in the West where they define people below the poverty level, they call it, right? When you're below earning so much a month, you know, a year, um, then you're considered to be in a state of poverty. Next question, from Habiba, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, what should a pregnant or nursing mother who is unable to fast do? Make up the fast later or feed the poor? There are a series of opinions. I want to know the most accurate opinion, Allahu Alam. You know, there are a series of opinions, as you said, um, among the Sahaba, those who said that it's not, you don't, you don't have to fast and uh, you don't have to feed anybody afterwards. Um, others said, yes, you do have to feed. Uh, you could say it is more uh, comprehensive, more certain if you feed somebody uh, after, feed the poor, you know, that's uh, not able to fast, not gonna be able to make it up later. Uh, then uh, you can feed the poor. That's, the, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good move. Um, even if you weren't required, then you're, you're still gaining the reward of doing it. And really, you know, as a number of scholars say, I mean, when you say you can't fast, it's really, you, you know, what, is the, what do you mean by you can't fast? Um, 
Is it something where you are truly unable, you start to breastfeed your child, you know, uh, you start to feel weak, you're, you're, you're suffering, this type of thing, or it's just you don't like to, or, you know, again, you know, we should make sure that when we don't do these things, you know, as best as possible we do it when we really can't. Okay. Fasting has benefits. Not being able to fast, you lose those benefits. So we should always try to stay focused on that soul, that soul principle of Ramadan, of taqwa. Aisha Khanum, USA, question, what kind of dua did our prophet uh, use to say in the month of Ramadan? Uh, special for Ramadan, I don't recall any special dua for Ramadan. Um, the duas that he made in Tahajjud, these are the well-known duas. Um, so I would have to leave it at that. I don't recall a specific dua, but he just gave us specific uh, issues that we should be conscious of to, to do uh, in order to ensure that we get the most out of Ramadan. Um, this I question next question, Madia Hashaukat from Kuwait, you know, about the typical division of the, the the Ramadan into sets of ten days. The first ten days are the days of mercy, next ten are the t days of forgiveness, the last ten uh, saving people from the hellfire. Um, there's no hadith on this, you know. Again, this is uh, things which people have said. Um, as a means of helping people to focus on the different elements or aspects of Ramadan that we should focus on, it is true that we should be focused on the mercy of Allah throughout Ramadan. Really, it's not just the first 10 days, it's throughout Ramadan. We should be seeking Allah's forgiveness throughout Ramadan, not just in the second 10 days, you know, and um, trying to save ourselves from the hellfire. This is something that we should, by avoiding evil, uh, words, deeds, etc. This is something we should be doing throughout the month of Ramadan. Next question. From Ujala from Pakistan. Is brushing teeth with toothpaste allowed during the fast? Yes, it is. Don't swallow the toothpaste. What do we do if we committed a sin during our fast? We seek Allah's forgiveness. I don't think that the fact that we're fasting, we're not going to commit any sins. Of course, we are going to, going to, because we commit sins. As much as we strive, as hard as we try, something's going to happen. Some things are going to get by. So we seek Allah's forgiveness. We turn back to Him as quickly as possible and as sincerely as we can, seeking His forgiveness. Abdul Wahab Abdullahi from Nairobi, Kenya. What was the number of rakahs of Taraweeh at the time of the Prophet Muhammad and his Khulafa? The number of rakahs of Taraweeh were total 11, 8, 4 and 4, um, and 3 of Witr. That was the practice in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan, according to Aisha, his wife, radiallahu anha, as reported in Sahih Bukhari. But knowing that this is voluntary prayer. If one wants to do 20 or 40 or 80 or 100, you can. It's there for you. And no one is to stop you. But for you to say it should be 20, then we run into problems. Because we don't have any practice of the Prophet to affirm that. Next question. Uh, As Asana, uh, Afsana, sorry, Afsana from Vancouver, BC, British Columbia, Canada. If a young person is feeling weak and has a headache, does this excuse him or her from fasting? It depends. If young means what under puberty, of course, they're excused. 
if they're over puberty, meaning they're now adults, considered adults Islamically, does it excuse them from fasting? No. What are the rules for temporary sickness and, uh, ver and permanent sickness? Temporary sickness means you're sick, you know, and uh, you are going to uh, get over it after some time. You can make up those days of fasting. A person who is permanently sick or chronically sick is what they call it, you know, where this sickness is not going away. You've got it. It's going to be with you continually. Then you feed the poor for the days you can fast. As to the um, references, I mean, these are found in Fiqh Sunnah, uh, well-known books of Fiqh that are available in the market. These are all uh, referenced there. Nafisa from the U.S., is it from the Sunnah to greet people during this month by saying Ramadan Kareem or Ramadan Mubarak? No. It's not from the Sunnah to say that. Uh, the Sahaba used to say, Taqabbalah minna wa minkum. May Allah... Oh, oh, sorry, this was um, for the Eid, saying that around the Eid. But the point is that um, to say uh, Ramadan Kareem on occasion, or Ramadan Mubarak on occasion, it's just saying, right, you know, may, may, may your Ramadan be blessed. You know, may you have a blessed Ramadan. It's a good thing to say. There's no harm. But where it turns, you turn it into a ritual where you have to say Ramadan Kareem, Somebody has to reply back Ramadan Mubarak, or if they say Mubarak, you have to say Kareem, and you know it becomes now a ritual where everybody is saying it all the time. Then now we're creating a new Sunnah, <clears throat> and this is not from the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So to do it on occasion, without making it a standard practice, there is no harm. Ayman Khan from India, if we have exams in, in or after Ramadan and we study for it with a good intention, will it be included in the ibadah? Well, if we consider that studying is a form of ibadah, then if we study in Ramadan, it is also ibadah. But, you know, we have different levels of ibadah that we focus on. In Ramadan, our ibadah, you know, we focus on certain other elements. So studying shouldn't be the major element, as the, some of the scholars have said, Ramadan should not be like the regular days. The days of Ramadan should not, there should not be no difference between these days and those days. There should be a difference. We're in Ramadan. This is the month of Quran. You want to study, study the Quran. I'm not saying don't study for your exam. Yes, you have to study for your exam also. But, you know, don't let that now overshadow everything else. There is worship element involved in that study that you're doing studying for your exams, if you have the right intention, you're seeking that knowledge in order to be able to benefit your community, to benefit and look after yourself and your family, etc., you know, and you are conscious of your responsibility with regards to the knowledge that you're gaining, then this is ibadah also. You are being worshipped for, you are worshipping Allah when you do it. Further question? Firdausi Akhtar, Bangladesh question, does the Qareen leave us during Ramadan or is it just Iblis? Well, it's the major evil forces, the major evil forces amongst the jinn. They are chained up. But minor evil forces, the devils amongst humankind, they're still running around still corrupting, corruptive elements will remain with us. So it is the marada to shayateen, the, the uh, major uh, elements amongst the devils that are chained up and give us this month, by an Allah chains them up or has them blocked from affecting us, gives us a better chance develop taqwa and to grow spiritually in this month. Next question. Simone Breyer from Germany. Her question, 
Does it break the fast when one unintentionally swallows a little drop of water? No, while making wudu. Whether making wudu or not making wudu. Ramadan. What is the ruling if one isn't sure about if he or she swallowed water? If you're not sure about whether you swallowed water or not, you haven't swallowed water. Take it that way. When you're sure you've swallowed, then you have an issue. Did you do it accidentally? It doesn't matter. It doesn't count. If you drank it unknowingly, you forgot. You're fasting. You're in the early days of Ramadan. You forgot your fasting. So you drank a whole glass. And then you realize after. Somebody called out to you, hey, you're fasting. Oh, stop. Your fast is still intact, according to the Prophet Next question. Uh, Rashman Hassan from Bangladesh. If one missed some fasts due to valid reasons, does he or she have to make up those before the next Ramadan? Yeah, it's preferable. It's preferable to do so before the next Ramadan. As soon after Ramadan as possible is better. You know, this is the best time to make it up. Yes, you can leave it, you can extend it, and people commonly do, but it's not the best thing. The best thing is within the next month, Shawwal, finish off those things that are outstanding. Those days of fasting that you missed, or whatever for any reason, do them. Do them before you do the six of Shawwal. You get that additional reward. Do them before. Don't make the six of Shawwal an excuse for not doing the fast that you missed in Ramadan. Joanne Ibrahim from New York, USA. Can I can a woman attend Tarawih Salah in the Masjid if it displeases her husband or he makes it clear he does not want her to attend every night? It's better that she doesn't. It's better that she doesn't. Because it's not an obligation on her. It's better that he allow her. I you know, there's no doubt about that. I mean, unless there are reasons and factors which are justifiable reasons. If it is just that he, he prefers her to be at home, um, you know, so when he comes home, she does the things that he needs for the home or whatever, you know, then it's still allowable. It's okay for him to do it, though it is better for him to allow her to go because Prophet Sallallahu had said, you know, don't prevent your woman from going to the mosques. He, this was his advice. Don't prevent your woman from going to the mosques. Because a husband, really, unless you've got a really good reason to stop her, you shouldn't. But, if he doesn't have a good reason, and he says, I don't want you going, it's better for you not to go. You'll get the same reward when you pray at home, and you'll also get the reward of obeying your husband. You know? And know that if that's what Allah has destined for you in this type of circumstance, know that in fact it's better for you. There's good in it for you. Just try to find the good. Turn it into something good. Rather than allow it eat away at you, why is he doing this, he shouldn't be doing it, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe he shouldn't. We'd advise him not to. But if he did, know that he has a need, or you have got some issues, look into it. Try to understand it. Try to take benefit from it. Next question. Rosetta from Malaysia. How do we keep the soul of Ramadan alive after Ramadan? It seems when Eid arrives, all the good habits developed during Ramadan fade away. If that happens, then it means that we really haven't developed those habits. You know, we did them. Maybe we did them for the wrong reasons. We didn't do them consistently. We didn't do them in the right way. There are a variety of different reasons which would lead to the dissipation, the disappearing of this good that we have achieved during Ramadan. If it was real good, it's not going away. So we have to look at the quality of the good habits. You see, rather than the quantity, we tend to look at the quantity. I did this, I did that, I did the other, did this. I did all of these things. And after Ramadan, I didn't feel like doing them anymore. Better you have done only five things. Choose five important things that you would like to introduce into your life that you know would be good for you. 
in Ramadan, try to introduce the Eid. That's five. This Ramadan. And if you work on them throughout Ramadan, inshallah, when, when the Eid comes, they're not going to disappear. They're going to be with you. Till the next Ramadan, you choose another five. And start working on them. So it's really how you tackle it. How do you go about developing these spiritual principles and elements which constitute the soul of Ramadan, taqwa, throughout our lives. Uh, Aisha Siddiqa from Pakistan asks, if I want to keep myself in a state of ablution, bad ideas come in my mind more frequently, how can I stop them? Does it affect my fast? One, it doesn't affect your fast. But if you're trying to keep ablution, to keep in a state of purity for prayer and other acts of worship, and it seems to come more frequently when you try to be uh, pure, how do you stop it? Well, know that the harder you try to be more spiritual, the harder shaitan will try to break your spirit. This is just a normal pattern that this spiritual battle follows. This is the nature of that battlefield. That the harder you strive, the greater the resistance. In the world today, we look at the Muslim world, we see all of these forces arrayed against Muslims, you know, screeching at us, you know, calling us names in the press and all this kind of thing. Go back 50 years, you didn't see it. Why? We're sleeping. When we woke up, then all of a sudden, all of this resistance comes. You know, building up, building up, building up. So know that the greater the resistance, it means the greater the awakening. So similarly, as you are awoken to wanting to keep yourself in the state of wudu, right? And what comes with the wudu, it should also be, you know, that, that uh, sole principle of taqwa. Not just the physical act of wudu, you've made the act of wudu, you see, because what happens is that when you just do that, when you've only done the act, you've made, you've done wudu, and you think, and all these ideas come, and you can't fight them, because your act of wudu was without soul. Wudu has a soul. You did the body, but you didn't do the soul. So it means that you need to Look at the, bo this, the body and the soul of wudu. The body is to do it right, wash everything properly and in your mouth, etc. But the soul, as the Prophet says, that when you wash your mouth, etc., wash your face, you're washing away the sins. So it's about purification, internal purification. So if you have not focused on the soul of wudu, which we reiterate when we complete the wudu and we say, Allah maj'alna min al-tawwabin wa ja'alna min al-mutatahirin. Oh Allah, make us among the tawwabin. Tawwabun, who are the tawwabun? Those who repent to Allah regularly. Because in repentance is purification from sin. Oh min al-mutatahirin. And among those who purify themselves. Because tawba purifies. These, these are the two principles that we should keep in mind during our wudu. I think we're going to take our last two questions now. We have the first one from Anna Mateen, India. When we're offering taraweeh at home, should we leave out the witr prayer and follow it up after tahajjud prayer, or should we pray witr along with taraweeh? Well, you know, really, tahajjud is, witr, is, is, is taraweeh. Raweeh and Tahajjud are one and the same. People just call it another name during Ramadan. But it's really Tahajjud. It's Tahajjud. So we don't need to turn it into two different acts. If you prefer to delay your Tahajjud to a late, latter part of the night, as opposed to doing it in the, in the early part, right after Isha, remember that the Sunnah of the Prophet was to do it in the latter part. 
not right after Isha. The Sahaba didn't used to do it right after Isha. Only those who feared that they would not be able to get up in time for Isha, they did it right after. To get up in time for Tahajjud in the latter part, the third, the last third of the night. When they thought they couldn't do that, you know, likely they're going to oversleep. They were very tired, whatever. Then okay, they would pray it right after Isha. So know that Tahajjud and Taraweeh and Qiyamul Layl are all one and the same thing. Second question, last question from Munshi in Sri Lanka. If the Imam is conducting 20 rakats of Taraweeh, can we follow the Imam? Yes. Is it a sin to follow him? No. Because according to the Hadith, 8 rakats of Taraweeh. No, the Hadith just said what the Prophet ﷺ did. It didn't say you have to do that. So following the Imam in 20 rakat is perfectly okay. But claiming that it should be 20 rakat is not okay. And that is error. Inshallah, that is the last of our questions. And um, as I said, and as I expected, many of our questions ended up focusing on the body of Ramadan. Please, brothers and sisters, my students, my sons and daughters, please do try to focus this month, this Ramadan, on the soul of Ramadan. Barakallahu feekum. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha ant. Astaghfiruka.